Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Mark 12, 17 Dear Lord, we acknowledge our need for you in every aspect of our lives. Help us to discern the times and seasons, understanding that everything has its place according to your divine plan. Transform our hearts, Lord, so that we may diligently honor you in every season. Give us the strength to fulfill our earthly responsibilities with integrity and faithfulness, while never losing sight of our ultimate devotion to you. Empower us to recognize and seize opportunities to glorify your name in our daily lives, whether in work, relationships, or service. May your Spirit guide us to be diligent stewards of all you've entrusted to us, always reflecting your love and truth. Let our lives be a testament to your grace, bringing light and hope to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for praying with me today. This is the Jesus Podcast, gospel-inspired stories written with purpose and produced with cinematic flair. Stick around to hear today's take on taxes, the kingdom of God, and loyalty. The room flickered with a warm glow. Oil lamps were set about the room and cast shadowy figures on the stone walls. Around a weathered wooden table stood a group of men. They all dressed similarly, from the blue fringed robes falling down their shoulders to the scowls they adorned on their faces. The Pharisees had habitually gathered to discuss the continually nagging problem that was Jesus of Nazareth. As months rolled into years, their anger simmered, and they were determined to escalate their plans. This cannot continue. It's not enough to spend our days arguing with the man. We have to stop him, especially after that whole wedding banquet fiasco. The disrespect this so-called rabbi continues to show Adonai and us has no end. Amram fastened his belt around his waist tighter. As one of the group's leaders, he had found himself at the end of his wits dealing with the rabbi from Nazareth. And how exactly do you propose we stop him? Every time we get close to trapping him in his words, it just draws more people. It's as if they like listening to his lies. If we can't stop him, then perhaps it's time we have him secured in a more tangible way. We must have him arrested. On what grounds? On the grounds that he's not only leading our people astray, but he's causing chaos wherever he goes. The Romans hate chaos. Amram pounded his fist on the table before composing himself once more. We just need to get Rome to see the same thing we do. Why would Rome care about the ramblings of a Jew? Oh, Lemuel, it's as if you have forgotten our role. People will always be susceptible to the enchanting tales of false prophets and teachers. It's up to us to do whatever is necessary to show them the truth. But... It won't be long before we bring honor to Adonai. If you would be so kind as to get me Ezra. Lemuel left the room and returned with a young man. His face showed an age beyond his years. He had become a Pharisee to please his parents, but the life never suited him. The entanglement of religious zealousness, political scheming, and struggles for power were all too much for him. Ezra, I have an errand for you to run. Ezra nodded his head in trained obedience. 
Jesus is said to have been in the area for some time, send word to the Herodians that we would like to cordially invite them to rendezvous on one of his little teachings. If we're to make a move against him, we'll need all the political prowess we can garner. The young Pharisee bowed his head. He turned on his heels and headed for the door. Are you in pain after walking, running, or even just standing? It's not your feet. It's your shoes. This summer, switch to GDefy Shoes with patented VersoShock technology, which aligns your body, provides superior shock absorption, and trampoline-like energy return. GDefy offers soles and styles for any activity, plus two free orthotics. Whether you're an athlete, a busy parent, or always on the go, GDefy Shoes deliver the comfort and versatility your feet crave. Say goodbye to discomfort and hello to unparalleled support this summer. Enjoy a special summer offer. Visit gdefy.com and get $20 off your order of $100 or more with code PRAY. Experience the miracle of ultimate comfort with GDefy Shoes. Visit gdefy.com today. While we live in this world and fulfill our responsibilities, our hearts, minds, and souls are devoted to God's kingdom. This dual citizenship, being citizens of both heaven and earth, can sometimes feel like a balancing act. We want to live faithfully to God, but we also need to navigate the realities of the world around us. This is the Jesus Podcast. I'm Ethan with Pray.com. Today, we continue through our mini-series on Jesus disrupting the status quo and showing us a new way to live. This series showcases Jesus' teachings and passion, and we will learn about God's heart for people and His kingdom. Today, we're going to dive into a story where Jesus tackles a tricky question about taxes. Now, I know taxes aren't exactly our favorite topic, but hang with me, because there's something deeper going on here that has a lot to teach us about living out our faith in the world. Jesus and the disciples were setting up camp for another night in the countryside. As had become usual, Jesus had departed to pray in solitude, leaving the disciples the task of delegating responsibilities. They had become so accustomed to this rhythm that very few instructions were necessary before the disciples formed groups and went about their jobs. Peter and Andrew were tasked with fishing, and they convinced James and John to join them. Nathaniel had led a group into town to purchase a few necessities. Back at the camp, Matthew and Philip were preparing wood for the group. The ax swung down, splintering the wood. As Philip cut the logs to size, Matthew stacked them neatly around the ring of stones, forming a makeshift fire pit. Tell me, Philip, what was it like following John before you had ever met Jesus? I can't say I'm not a little jealous. I wasted so much of my life behind the tax booth. (laughs) Nothing is wasted if we allow the Lord to redeem it, even your time as a tax collector. There was Philip's steadfastness, as always. He was relentlessly positive. He always knew what to say to comfort others. He wasn't worried about his perception among the other disciples. He had no jealousy of power or fear of Jesus' preference. He knew he was called and loved by Jesus, which was more than enough for him. The Lord prepares us in different ways. He molds and shapes us to be used how he best sees fit. My time with John allowed me to break my prejudice of what I believed the Messiah would look like. When you follow a man dressed in camel fur (laughs) who eats bugs for breakfast, you find yourself pretty open to most people after that. Matthew couldn't help but laugh at the absurd picture. He knew it was true. Philip was among the most welcoming and caring people he had ever met. Before following Jesus, the people who hated him the most were his Jewish kin. He was embarrassed thinking that the Roman guards who escorted him were his closest friends, if you could even call them that. Well, Matthew, how did the collections go today? 
Matthew peered through the bars of his booth. The sun begged to settle gently on the horizon, which meant it was almost time to close up for the day. Good evening, Decimus. They've gone as well as one could hope. But with how things are trending, I'm not quite sure how the books will look tomorrow. As if today didn't have enough worries of its own. Matthew's chest felt heavy with anxiety. He felt the pressure of wanting to please Rome while simultaneously facing the indignation of his people. Deep down, he knew he was hurting them. But it would just be by someone else if it weren't him collecting their taxes. He tried his best to convince himself that what he did was a necessary evil outside his control. You all right there? I said, do you have any plans for the rest of the evening? Decimus broke Matthew from his idle musings. Oh, um, no. In my occupation, you don't tend to make many friends, but I've grown accustomed to being alone. What about family? It would probably be easier to find friends than family at this point. Let me ask you something, Matthew. You're a numbers guy, right? Do you know what Decimus means? One could guess it has something to do with the number ten. Bingo! In Rome, Decimus is the name families often give to their tenth-born son. See, I grew up to be the runt of the litter. But starting at the bottom means the only direction you can go is up. Matthew gave a courteous smile, but his confusion was noticeable. All I'm saying is, you're good at what you do. You'll find the right people eventually. As Matthew stood talking with Philip, he knew that he had found the right people. Maybe there was truth to what Philip had said about God redeeming all things. He just had to let him. Matthew, Philip, come quick. The Pharisees and the Herodians, what's going on? Is everything okay? Yes, I mean, no. I mean, well, we're not sure. Just come with us. A group of Pharisees found Jesus while he was praying, but they seem different. It's almost as if they like him. Out of the tree line burst Peter and Andrew. Matthew and Philip looked at each other, puzzled. The men raced to where Peter and Andrew had first found Jesus in the small gathering. Behind Jesus stood the rest of the disciples, and before him, the collection of Pharisees. Jesus welcomed the four disciples as they made their way closer. Shalom. Perfect timing. We just finished introductions, and our new friends here say they have not come to harass us, but with a sincere question. Isn't that a nice change of pace? Jesus pivoted back to the Pharisees and Herodians. So please, Ezra, what is it? How can I help you all today? Ezra cleared his throat. He needed to sound genuine. His years of playing the part of a Pharisee came into use now. Acting had become a natural part of his interactions. Uh, teacher, we know you're a man of integrity. We've heard many teachers, and we know that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. As the disciples watched with hesitancy, they had never met a Pharisee who spoke so well of Jesus since Nicodemus. But Jesus just smiled at the young man, bowing his head slightly, to encourage him to continue. You aren't swayed by others because you ignore titles and accolades. It's clear your loyalties are to Adonai and Adonai alone. Ezra had mastered the art of flattery among the older Pharisees. Now was the time to set the trap. But we wonder how that loyalty plays out in the empire under Caesar's rule. Tell us then what your opinion is. Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? The Pharisees' question was calculated. If Jesus affirmed paying taxes, surely the crowds would deny him. But if he spoke against the taxes, he incriminated himself as an enemy of Rome. With Roman guards standing a few feet behind and the crowd of oppressed Jews surrounding him, there seemed to be no correct answer. There was a long pause. Matthew observed Jesus. His fists were tightening in anger. 
Clearly, he was in complete control. But a righteous rage coursed through his veins. And when the Pharisees thought Jesus had no response, he turned in one swift motion, like a lion on his prey. You hypocrites! You came to me under the thin veil of sincerity. Why are you trying to trap me? Do you think questions of taxes will cause the Son of Man to stumble? I have a former tax collector under my own followers, yet even he is pushed past this stumbling block. Jesus' eyes met Matthew. He gave him an approving nod. Show me the coin used to pay the tax. The men fumbled for their coin purse and removed a denarius. If you would, tell me whose image and inscription are carved on that coin. Caesar's, of course. The Pharisees answered sheepishly, sensing that Jesus had already prepared an argument against them. Then it is as simple as this. Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. The simplicity of the rabbi's reply left the men speechless. Nothing he said was wrong. It carried no irreverence toward God or disrespect towards Rome. Ezra had been instructed to feign his sincerity toward the rabbi. But listening to Jesus with his own ears, he found himself genuinely endeared to the man who stood before him. His respect bordered on reverence. He wasn't sure how the rest of the Pharisees would take the news. But as for Ezra, he couldn't help but walk away from the situation. <laughs> Amazed. In Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 through 22, the Pharisees and the Herodians come to Jesus with a loaded question. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, before we dig into Jesus' answer, let's take a moment to appreciate what's happening here. The Pharisees and the Herodians were not exactly best friends. In fact, they were more like political and religious rivals. But their mutual dislike for Jesus was strong enough to bring them together for this sneaky little scheme. Their question was a trap. If Jesus said, yes, pay the taxes, he'd upset the Jewish people who hated the Roman occupation. If he said, no, don't pay, he'd be in trouble with the Roman authorities. It seemed like a no-win situation, but Jesus, in his wisdom, wasn't about to be caught off guard. Jesus asks for a coin and then poses a simple question. Whose image and inscription is this? The answer is clear. Caesar's. Then Jesus delivers that famous line, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Now let's unpack this. Jesus isn't just dodging the question. He's giving a profound answer that speaks to the heart of our faith and our place in the world. First, by saying, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, Jesus acknowledges that there are legitimate responsibilities we have to the government and the society that we live in. As Christians, we're not called to be radicals who reject all worldly authority. Instead, we're called to be good citizens, to pay our taxes, and to contribute to the common good. It's a recognition that, yes, we live in the world, and there are things we owe to the structures that maintain it. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He adds, and to God, the things that are God's. This is where it gets really interesting. The coin might bear Caesar's image, but we bear the image of God. Our ultimate loyalty, our highest allegiance, belongs to God alone. While we live in this world and fulfill our responsibilities, our hearts, our minds, and our souls are devoted to God's kingdom. This dual citizenship, being citizens of both heaven and earth, can sometimes feel like a balancing act. We want to live faithfully to God, but we also need to navigate the realities of the world around us. Jesus shows us that it's possible to do both, but we must keep our priorities straight. Let's bring this home. We're called to be good witnesses in the culture and context we're placed in. We're not here to dismantle every worldly power or to create a Christian utopia. Instead, we're here to live out our faith in such a way that people are drawn to Christ. We are a movement of peace, not of rebellion. Our mission is to win hearts and minds to the truth of Jesus, not to overthrow governments or withdraw from society. Peter put it beautifully when he said, Fear God, honor the king, 
1 Peter 2, verse 17. This doesn't mean we blindly follow every rule or never speak out against injustice. It means we respect the authorities while always remembering that our ultimate authority is God. We live in this tension, being faithful to God while being respectful and responsible members of society. And let's not forget what's at stake. When we render to God what is God's, we're giving Him our very selves, our time, our talents, our treasure. We're recognizing that everything we have and everything we are belongs to Him. This means living with integrity, showing kindness and love to others, and being faithful witnesses of the gospel in all that we do. So, as we go about our lives, paying our taxes, going to work, engaging in our communities, let's remember where our true allegiance lies. Let's be good citizens of earth, but even better citizens of heaven. Let's render to Caesar what is his, but give to God what is rightfully his. Our hearts, our worship, our whole lives.